Everybody, we're a bit behind schedule this, this morning. A uh, little bit uh, holiday mode, I think, just chilling, as they say. It's good to see you all. And um, as always, we come into his presence, you know, with, with songs of joy in our hearts because he has given us, he has put his joy into our hearts and we can we can just worship him. It, no matter what your week has been like, you know, maybe it's been a great week, maybe it's not been such a great week, but, you know, we look beyond that, we, he lifts us up, you know, and it's like the eagle rising up on wings above our circumstances. He lifts us up. The Holy Spirit is the wind under our wings. to so lift us up above our circumstances and lift us up to that place where we just see him and him alone and, and give him thanks and glory for, you know, for all that he has done for us. For his amazing, amazing sacrifice on that cross that we're, we're going to sing about. So, Father, we thank you again today that your love was so great that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. We thank you this morning that we have the Son and those who have the Son have life. And we thank you for eternal life and that is, is knowing you. For you, God our Father, and, and Jesus, whom you sent. So, receive our worship this morning, Lord God. We know that your ear is attentive, Lord God. We know that your eyes go back and forth across the earth to see who is lifted up this morning to worship you, who has raised themselves up just to sing your praises, Lord God.
Thy strength indeed is small, child of love. 
the sins of all mankind for all times. And today he is seated at God's right hand in glory, far above all principalities and powers, all might and dominion, every name that's named in this world and in the world to come. And he has been given everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. And not only that, but we too are seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In the spiritual realm, we are seated with him in glory. This is our God. And today we consider him who endured such hostility from sinners, such hostility against himself. And we're not to grow weary or faint hearted. So as we come around this table this morning, we take the bread and we take the cup. We're reminded again of that he is the bread of life. He is the door to glory. He is the good shepherd. He is the one who leads his sheep. And he said, my sheep, they hear my voice and follow me. I know them. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will take them from my hands. And the Father, he said, who has given them to me, who is greater than all, no one can take them from the Father's hands because I and the Father are one. So we celebrate the shepherd this morning as we take the bread and the cup.
promise of endless mercy, goodness and mercy to follow us all the days of our lives. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, my Lord. And even though we walk to the valley of death, even though we walk to the valley of death, we will fear no evil. The valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us, Lord God. Your God and your staff will come to us, Lord God. We will dwell in your house forever, Lord God. Forever and ever we will dwell in your house, Lord God. Down here we are your house, we are your dwelling place, Lord God. And when we go to be with you, Lord God, we go to completeness, Lord God. Go to glory forever, forever to be in your house. You are the good shepherd who cares for your sheep, Lord God. You are the good shepherd who gave up your life for the sheep, Lord God. And in you, Lord, we have everything. In you, we have everything, Lord God.
many would come to the knowledge of you, to the knowledge of the, of the true and living God, the one who gave his life for us, Lord God. That no one else would be lifted up but you, Jesus. No name would be lifted up, Lord God. No name would be venerated. No name would be worshipped but your name, O oh Lord God. That every other name would be bowed down to you, Lord God. Every other name would be brought low, Lord. Every high place would be flattened, Lord God. And you would be given your rightful place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Flowing to this land till every man raises your name once more. That's our prayer today, that his name would be lifted up, his name would be exalted on high, that no name but the name of Jesus would be given glory and honor because he is the one who gave his life for us. He is the one who died so we might live. So we lift up his glorious name today. We lift up that name that has lifted us from the depths of our sin, lifted us up from the miry clay and set our feet upon that rock which is Christ. And there we stay well, it's wonderful to see you all today, again, and uh, just remind you again that on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. in Tom and Heather's, we're continuing our series on the end times, and we're talking about the marriage ceremony of the Lamb uh, this week again, and um, then we continue on with what happens, you know, once the church is taken from the earth. And we know that the Lord can come at any time, it can come at any moment, uh, it can be today, it can be this hour, it can be this minute we don't know but once the church is taken away that begins a time of trouble for the world like it's never seen before i mean the people in the ukraine at this moment in time think they're going through you know a terrible time and they are but it's nothing it's absolutely nothing it's a walk in the park compared to what's going to be happening during that time of tribulation the time of what's referred to as jacob's trouble uh, in the in those seven years before the lord then comes back again with the church to rule from the throne of David in Jerusalem for a thousand years. So it's good to know what's going to happen once the church is taken out of the earth so we can, you know, it can give us more cause to pray for those who are not in the kingdom. Pray them into the kingdom, amen. So today we're going to look at um, John's Gospel in chapter two, and that's, that's a very well-known story of the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee. Uh, reading in John 2 and verse 1. But before we go there, you know, as we've been worshipping, I know the Lord speaks always. He's always speaking to us. Night and day, he's speaking to us. We're not always listening, but he is speaking night and day. And at times when we gather together as a church, you know, he speaks to us as well, but he speaks to us also uh, to those who have the gift of prophecy. He speaks to us uh, word for the church. So this morning as we've been worshipping, if you felt the Lord has put something on your heart this morning, that is uh, for the body, for the church, then do please take this time to share that with us and, uh, and, and bless us. Amen.
you know, in, in the world uh, there's a system of hierarchy and indeed in religion as well there is a, a system of hierarchy, there's a there's kind of steps of a ladder and just as, as, as um, I was just looking down at the ground you know, a, a moment ago and God speaks to me sometimes in pictures and you notice the floorboards are uh, going up and down the floor but when you come to this area here they take a different direction and then there's new floorboards and this of course is what's known as a dancing area in a, in a hall and um, it looks like a line of separation but uh, I just thought the Lord you know wants to wants us all to know that there is no separation there is no hierarchy in his kingdom he is king of kings and we are all his children and just because I stand here doesn't make me any bit different than you you know what you do for Christ is just as important as what I do. I just have a different job. Doesn't mean that I'm up here and you're down there because we're all believers. We're all priests unto God. We all have access to his throne. I don't have any different access to you. And I just feel that somebody needs to hear that this morning, that you are, you are special. You are precious to him. You are precious. And maybe the enemy has been playing games with you and telling you because of this, that, and the other, you're not special. Or because you haven't gained enough brownie points that you're not special. I heard a preacher once say, you know, he said, to, um, as he got up to speak, he said to the congregation, he said, you know, if you knew my sin, he said, you wouldn't be here listening to me today, he said. But if I knew your sin, I wouldn't want to be here either, he said. You know, there is no difference. We all sin, we all fall short of his glory, but he has put the punishment for all our sin on the body of his son Jesus. And when he looks at us, he doesn't see us in our sin, he sees us covered in that robe of righteousness. We all have the same robe. He sees us all as his children. There's no hierarchy in his children. Just to be encouraged today that you are precious in his sight. Amen. In John's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars, the uh, water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And they stayed there for a few days. And so, Father, again, as we look at your word, we pray again, Lord. Uh, that our hearts will be open to receive what you have to say to us in Jesus name Amen The wedding at Cana and you know weddings are very precious in God's eyes because there is a day coming as I said earlier when we will be part of that wonderful uh, wedding ceremony the greatest of all times when we the bride of Christ will be married to the groom but here in this passage we see this wedding feast and and um, Weddings nowadays are not just a one-day event. We were at a wedding on Friday. Uh, Terry's niece got married, and it's a two-day event. And uh, during the week, I was in at my hairdresser or my barber, whatever you want to call her, and she said, "You know, well, some weddings are four-day events." And we think this is, you know, this is uh, uh, going out out of, out of control altogether. But in the time of Jesus, weddings were a week long. They they celebrated for a whole week. Banquets would be prepared for many guests, and the week would be spent celebrating the new life of the married couple. <clears throat> and after the whole town was invited, and everyone would come, in fact, it was an insult to uh, the family to refuse an invitation to a wedding. And of course, to accommodate the great numbers, uh, careful planning was obviously needed. And here at this wedding feast in Cana, the guests had run out of wine. 
and to another the wine was, was, was rather embarrassing. It, it, it broke the strong unwritten laws of hospitality. And this is why Mary, as a mother herself, would have, would have felt embarrassment for the hosts. And even though she hadn't um, witnessed any of Jesus' miracles, she obviously felt that he could do something. My son can do something. When they ran out of wine, she said they have no wine. So the question I suppose is, if she hadn't seen any of his miracles, why would she have thought to bring it to his attention? And, and when she did, she didn't get the response that she was obviously expecting because he said to a woman, what is this to do with me? My hour has not yet come. It was as if uh, Jesus was saying, you know, that's not my problem. As one of my daughters says, that sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. Uh, so uh, apart from that, his time for, for, for performing miracles, as he said, had not yet come. So why did Mary come to him? Well, first of all, her concern was, of course, for the honor of the bride and the groom's family who were hosting the wedding, because in those days, family honor was of vital importance. The family must be honored no matter what. And to run out of food or wine at a wedding feast suggested the hosts were either thoughtless or they were impoverished. And, and this would bring dishonor on the family. And the fact that Mary was, was concerned as well would also suggest that she was involved some way in the planning of this wedding because uh, Mary was there, uh, uh, Jesus was there, and in the passage we read, it said his mother, uh, Jesus' mother, and his brothers, and his disciples were with him. And of course, this is another example you know, of the proof that Jesus actually had brothers and sisters but it just mentions his brothers here. So obviously, uh, it, it, it's, it's probable, as a, uh, sorry, it's probable that Mary was involved in um, the planning and preparation of the wedding as well. Now I've lost my place, but I'll find it. So uh, again, the fact that we read in verse 13 that after the wedding, Jesus' brothers uh, traveled with him in the case of the whole family, as I said, who were present or was present for the wedding. Now, out of concern for family honor, Mary turned to her son for help. Her family was about to be shamed in, in the community, or at least the family of the bride and groom. There's no definitive proof that it was her family, but at least she was concerned for the honor of the bride and groom's family. And she knew her son could do something. Most mothers believe their sons you know, can do more than maybe their sons can do. But if there was one thing that Mary knew more than anyone else, it was the fact that when she got pregnant with Jesus, she knew, she knew that this was a miracle of God. Because she knew she hadn't been with a man, she knew she was a virgin, and more than anyone else, she knew that what was conceived inside of her was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure she would have spent much time Studying the scriptures, because as a, a Jewish woman, she would have known the scriptures. Studying the scriptures and finding the passages that refer to the Messiah being born of a virgin. And in studying the scriptures, I'm sure she would have come across passages like the one in Isaiah 35 and verse 5 and 6, which talks about Jesus. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And further study would assure her that her son was more powerful than anyone imagined. This was about her son. Not alone was he powerful, but his power was from God, his power was divine, and it was miracle working power. She wouldn't necessarily know from scripture when these uh, miracles were about to begin, but she saw a problem at this wedding feast. And she probably thought, why wait? Now is as good a time as ever. Jesus, on the other hand, said that uh, <laughs> this wasn't his time to publicly announce who he was, and as far as he was concerned, his hour had not yet come. Now, as he said those words, he probably watched Mary turn to the servants and tell them to do whatever Jesus said. And he's probably thinking, she didn't even hear what I said. Did she hear a word I said? 
And at this stage, I imagine, and this is only I can only imagine, that Jesus would have a quiet word with the Father. Have a word about my mother. What, what's going on here? You know, I've told her my hour has not yet come, and yet she's gone off behaving as if I'm going to do some miracle right now. Do whatever he tells you. Now what I see in this, in, in this uh, passage is the faith of Mary reaching into the future and bringing something into the present. She reached into the future and brought something that had not yet come right into the present by her faith. She prayed believing that Jesus could do something and then she went and did something that demonstrated her faith in the ability of Jesus to answer her request. She believed, I have asked him, and even though he said it's not for now, but I'm going to believe it is for now. So start getting ready to do something when he tells you. And of course the result is that she saw the answer to her prayer unfolding before her eyes. Jesus didn't say another word, or at least there's no other word recorded, but in verse 6, now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish, water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up. And he said to them, draw, now draw some out, and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him everyone serves the good wine first when people have drunk freely did the poor wine but you have kept the good wine until now so here is the first of jesus miracles as, as is recorded in verse 11 the first of his signs jesus did at cana in galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him maybe by her faith and by demonstrating what she believed, instigated this miracle. I'm not saying that she was the one who performed the miracle. I'm just saying she asked her son, Jesus, to do something that as a man, he didn't have the power to do, but as a son of God, he called on God, and God gave him the power to do that miracle. And as we read this, we have to realize that every portion of scripture is for our benefit and is given to help us grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. So what do we learn from this? Well, lesson one, no matter what the situation you're in, no matter what difficulty or no matter what problem, no matter how impossible it seems, Jesus is the first one to go to for help. Jesus is the first one to go to for help. Notice Mary didn't go to the to the to the to the master of the, of the ceremony. He didn't go to the, the to the, the wine merchants. She didn't go to the wine merchants. She went directly to her son Jesus. And when we have a situation that's impossible for us, that needs to be our first port of call. Go to Jesus. Go to him and simply tell him what's wrong. That's step number one. They have no wine. Now, of course, wine, as we've sang about, wine is a symbol of joy and it's a symbol of, 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 of the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Having no wine meant there was no joy. They'd be grumbling, they would be complaining. As I said, we were at a wedding on Friday and several times they came around with the wine and pour the wine. You want more wine? Pour the wine. They have no wine. Go to Jesus. Step two, go and do something that shows that you expect Jesus to answer your prayer. It's like the story about the, the old lady who rang up the pastor one day. You've heard this before, but I wanted to share it again anyways. And she says, uh, somebody's after dumping a load of soil outside my door. Will you come around and pray? So the pastor came around and she asked him to pray that the soil would be removed. And he says, do you believe that if we pray, God, the word says, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and don't doubt in your heart, but believe. Do you believe that? And she says, I do, I do, Pastor. Well, let's pray so. So they prayed that the, the, the soil would be removed. The next morning, she rings up the pastor and she says, Pastor, she says, the soil is still there and I knew it would be. Now, does that show any faith? That didn't show faith. So we must do something when we ask God, we do something to show that we expect him to answer. There's a story, I forget who the preacher is, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a preacher preaching in a, in a tent crusade 
And as he leaves the tent down there, everybody is gone. As he's leaving the tent, there's a little boy sitting down by the side of the tent, a little crippled boy, and he's a pair of shoes in his hand. And the, the, the preacher said to him, what are you waiting for? He said, I'm waiting for the preacher. Why are you waiting for the preacher? Because I'm crippled and I want him to heal me. And he said, who are the shoes for? They're for me so I can walk when I've been healed. So he did something to show that he believed that if this man prayed for him, he would be healed. We need to do something to show that we expect Jesus to answer. Mary said, do whatever he tells you. So we need to be ready then to do whatever he asks us to do and expect to see the miracle. Like the servants, he said, fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. They didn't ask why. They didn't say who needs water. And he said, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. So they did exactly what he told them. He spoke to the servants. The servants acted, even though it must have seemed ridiculous to them at the time. What is the point? Can you imagine who I have to? What's the point in all this? Why fill this jar with water? But when Jesus speaks, we are to act, no matter how outlandish his requests may seem at the time. Another story has come to my mind. Sometimes stories can help us understand. This woman is driving uh, somewhere in America on a fairly des deserted uh, motorway or highway or whatever. And as she approaches this little cafe filling station, she feels the Lord saying to her, go into that filling station, go into the cafe, go up to the jukebox and do a handstand at the jukebox. And she thinks, oh, I've lost my mind. Why would I need to go into that uh, filling station, go into that cafe? Why would I need to go to the jukebox? Why would I need to do a handstand at the jukebox? So she jumped past, but the Holy Spirit convicted her that she needed to do it. So she did, she walked in, looked in the door, and sure enough, there was a jukebox at the end of the, the cafe, and there was only one little old man sitting at the bar. So she thought, this is, this is okay. So she walked up to the jukebox, did a handstand at the jukebox, and was sneaking out when the old man said, come here, I want to talk to you. And she went up to the old man, and there's tears in his eyes, he's crying, he's crying. She said, what's up? When she did, says, I was a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus most of my life. And a number of years ago, something happened and I walked away from God. And I said, God, you don't exist anymore because you didn't answer some prayer, you don't exist. And here I'm sitting today and I'm thinking of my life and I'm thinking, God, if you exist, if you really are real, then show me that you're real. Send somebody in here today to do a headstand at that jukebox and I'll believe. Now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but it just, it's a story to, you know, sometimes God asks us to do what we think are the most ridiculous things. And yet, when we do them, we find that he is in it, in some way. I remember at a meeting once many years ago here in Belen and as the preacher was preparing his slides, <laughs> that shows how long ago it is, when we had overheads and slides, and as, as he was preparing his, his, his message or whatever, uh, I was preparing the worship, and I felt the Lord saying to me, go to him and tell him, and say these words to him, tell him that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon him, and that he has anointed him to preach the good news to the poor. And I'm thinking, surely he knows this. And I struggled with that for a while, but eventually God won the battle, and I walked over to him, and I said, I believe the Lord wants me to say this to you, that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you, because he has anointed you to preach the good news to the poor. And he said to me, how did you know that? I said, how did I know what? But he said, obviously God has given that to you because I'm after writing it on the overhead acetate. So thank you for encouraging me. See, sometimes God gives us words that we don't understand. And he gives us words to encourage somebody else. But if we start uh, trying to figure them out in our own minds, then we leave them aside. But if we go with whatever God has said to us, we find that he is leading us in an unusual way. As a result of the servant's obedience, the servants witnessed this great miracle, and the best wine was produced from plain water, and the host didn't know where it came from. You see, God has only his best for his children, and all he requires is that we ask by faith, believing, and we will see it come to pass. I refer to this passage earlier, James 1 and verse 6 and 7, let him ask in faith, no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. The old lady who prayed for that soil to be removed doubted in her heart 
Uh, she asked by faith maybe, but she doubted. She wavered. She wavered from what she believed. She didn't hold on tight to it. So we need to hold on tight to what we've asked for, believe it, and then do something that demonstrates our faith. This is pleasing to God, for without faith it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, faith in God's abilities to do the miraculous pleases him. And as we draw near to him, we show that we believe that he exists and we show that we believe that he rewards those who seek him. So first of all, it shows that we believe that he exists, but then it shows that he rewards those who <coughs> seek him. So go to Jesus, tell him your problem, and believe that he can do something about it. Then you go and do something that demonstrates you have faith to believe, and you will see the answer to your prayer. In Mary's case, her faith preserved the honor of the family, and they were commended for their excellent one. But not only that, God was glorified. See, everything God does is for his glory. In verse 11 it says, This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum and his, mother's, and his mother and his brothers and sisters, with his mother, sorry, and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So in this sign, Jesus manifested or made known his glory and his disciples believed in him. See, every time God performs a miracle in our lives, it's so he can manifest his glory. It's so he can make his glory known. And when others see or hear about the miracles of God in our lives, it will draw them to him so they can hear more about him. And the hope is that the miracles will confirm his power and his presence. And the hope is that they will hear the good news of what Jesus has done for them. Not alone has he paid the price for their healing, but he has paid the price for their salvation, their deliverance, their eternity, the forgiveness of their sins. And this brings glory to God. So when you have a problem, go to Jesus first and tell him what your problem is. And no matter what you feel he has said, go away and do something to show that you believe he has heard you, and if he has heard you, that he will do something about it. And then watch as he does what only he can do, as he performs the miracles, because he is the God of miracles. Amen. We're going to finish off with a song. But just before we do, I want to pray a prayer over us this morning and over whoever will be listening in. And it's a prayer of healing that the Lord put on my heart many years ago. And um, I had a sickness at Christmas that lasted for quite a while. And I would pray this prayer several times a day. And even now I pray it uh, at least twice a day. And this, the, the prayer itself is, is based totally on scripture. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a prayer acknowledging who God is and what he has done for us. So I'm going to pray it over us this morning. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your son. And we thank you that the help we've asked for in prayer, we receive. Even though we don't fully see it maybe in our bodies in some ways, we believe that we will see it, Lord. Jesus, I believe you took all our sins on your body on the cross, and so sin has no power over us. Instead, Jesus living in us makes us right with God. Dear Jesus, you once took our sickness on your body, and by your wounds we are healed. As you're living in us by your spirit, in your name, we now refuse to allow sickness of any kind to live in our bodies. Sickness, you're dead, and we command you out of our bodies in the name of Jesus. You live in our body now, because the life of God inside us drives out all sickness, and our strength is being restored. So God, our Father in heaven, you have rescued us from the power of sin, and brought us into the kingdom of your son Jesus, who loves us so much. Your son took us out of the pit of sin by paying the price through his death on the cross. 
His blood has bought forgiveness for all our sins and has taken our sickness. So we speak to our bodies now and speak to everyone's body now in the name of Jesus and I declare the sickness and pain have no right to be in our bodies. They are a thing of the past because we are free from the power of the devil. My God, your word is now part of us and as we receive it in our souls, it's flowing through our veins to every cell of our body, bringing healing and health to our bodies. Your word, it's your word, Lord, has become flesh and you sent your word and healed us. We called to you in our trouble, and you healed us and released us from the power of sickness. And God our Father, you brought us into your family, you made peace between us, even though at one time we were separated from you by our sin, you have brought us together by the body of your son Jesus through his death and resurrection. And Jesus, you are Lord of our lives, and sickness and disease have no more power over us. We're completely forgiven and free from sin and guilt. Our bodies are no longer a slave to sin. Instead, our bodies are alive to you, God our Father. And we know you have accepted us because of Jesus. So we will continue, Lord, to depend on you and your word. And hold on to the hope of the good news that you gave Jesus to die for us and to give us eternal life. So, Father in heaven, as we read your word, we will take heed of your sayings. We will listen and keep your words in our heart because they are life and they are health to our bodies. We're so thankful that it's your plan, O oh Lord, to give us a life of peace, a long and healthy life. And when we are satisfied with the years you give us, you will take us home to be with you forever. So Lord, now we present our bodies to you as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you in Christ Jesus. Our bodies are the place where you live by your Holy Spirit. You live in us and your life fills our spirit, soul and body. So we're full of you every day. So we now declare in Jesus' name that we will not die young, but we will live every day that you, Lord, have set out for us. We will live a long and healthy life and we tell others what you have done for us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayer. And Lord God, for every person here today who has any sickness in their body, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for freedom. We thank you for healing. We thank you for restoration. In Jesus' name.
died so we might live to the glory of the Father. And we thank you that each day we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for us, Lord God. We thank you and praise you this day for this gathering unto you, Lord God. And Lord, we thank you that you make known your presence in a powerful way when we gather together in your name. So we pray, Lord our God, that you impart us with your blessing, Lord God. Your blessing is always with us, that we would know your blessing with us every minute, every hour, every day, Lord God. So until we meet again, Lord God, we will watch between us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus.